the money. <laughs> Ready. Um, it is with um, with, with a, a heavy heart tonight like, that we open this class. And um, I am thankful for everybody who's here. Um, but in light of what's happening right now in, um, in our country, and should I say specifically, specifically in Buffalo, New York, I mean, um, that affects all of us. And we just came off of the same Copa trip. Mm. And all those uh, sites, everywhere from Atlanta to Montgomery to Selma, uh, Mississippi, Memphis, and even went to the, the last stop we made was at a slave house in Memphis. And we get back on Friday night, and then this is what we hear on Saturday. I mean, right when it looked like you're, you're about to have a breakthrough with, um, with all this stuff that's going on in our country right now, and here come an 18-year-old. We thought there was hope for the young people, because, but maybe no hope for the older people because it's ingrained. But then here's an 18-year-old young white male that want to kill black people. That, that, that's hard. That, that's hard to take. It's a whole motive is to kill black people. So I think tonight when we begin this class, now, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Professor Green, I know we're going to talk about love tonight. Mm -hmm. But to talk about love and in the midst of all this hate, I think is a very timely thing that we well, talk about in the midst of the hate we're facing. Yeah, well, I, I think another good thing in, that we should pray for in the midst of this is for that 18-year-old uh, man whose heart is basically governed by the devil, that in some way the light of the gospel would reach him and he repent. God has forgiven murderers before, and he made one of, an, one of them an apostle. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, it, it is a tragic and horrible thing, and what a great testimony that would make if he does repent. Wow. And that's something that, that, to be able to experience the forgiveness of God in a situation like this. That would yeah. be amazing. Yeah. That would be amazing. Pour his heart out with with sorrow, and uh, that, that'd be a grand statement. Yeah. Yeah, but like I said, he he's done that before, and he made one of those guys a, an apostle. Yeah. Thank you. Well, tonight, um, as we come to this class, it's the fourth class in our series of the uh, from from the Book of Glory in the in the Gospel according to John, and um, Tonight, what we want to do is um, um, continue with Dr. Green in the fourth class, as I said. And um, it's amazing that we're already at this point. And I want to thank you all, those of you who have, have, have given uh, something toward this ministry. Um, thank you for, for your donation. And I'm continually asking for donations because this is a ministry that I think is a very vital uh, ministry for such a time as this. And it's something that we want to do at Further Living is to bring real seminary style teaching um, and to this kind of uh, use a platform to do it. And, you know, Dr. Uh, Green is a, is a, uh, a, form, a professor at Faith Theological Seminary, at Dallas Theological Seminary, and then now in Houston. And for him to take out time to come with us at Further Living, it's amazing. So I thank you again, Dr. Green. And I'm asking you that if you can, those who can and will, please give us some kind of a, a donation to say you want this to continue. Because, and this will be our last class for this um, for this spring, but we'll be coming back in September uh, for the autumn and fall session. Uh, and then we have a winter session as well. And it'd be good for you to start checking in and let us know what you would like to see next. Uh, the type of class, the type of uh, thing you'd like to see us bring before you, whether it be in uh, continuously in uh, from the gospel or Old Testament, our uh, leadership perspective, whatever you like to see, this is what further living wants to uh, to bring to you in a very professional way. So tonight, again, uh, let us open up with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Green. 
God, our Father, God, our amazing God, how we love you tonight, who you are, what you've done, what we know you're going to do. God, it's you who's holding us, who's keeping us right now. Without you, God, we couldn't even be able to be on this call tonight. The enemy wants, wants us to stop this. The enemy don't want us to do this. The enemy wants us to have no hope. Right now, as Dr. Green has already said, we pray for a move of God in a mighty way. Touch that young man's heart, Lord. Let him realize what he's done, what he tried to do. But let him also know that regardless of what he tried to do and trying to break us apart, that it just brings us closer together. And we realize we are stronger. We are better. Okay, we're getting a little feedback here. Um, with um, reference to uh, what has happened in Buffalo, I mean, these are the works of the devil that Jesus. who are simply trying to buy groceries and that, that shouldn't be a hard thing to do without uh, someone in camouflage and body armor and uh, an assault rifle or whatever he used trying to interrupt just, just getting bacon and bread. Um, so uh, our hearts do go out for all of those who are hurting over the loss because uh, honestly, this is this senseless evil um, senseless evil. Um, and uh, everyone who wants to stay on that side with the devil uh, will receive the Lord's retribution and recompense for doing so. Uh, but while the gospel is out there, um, the, the Lord knows how to forgive murderers, uh, and the Lord also knows how to forgive people who uh, ignore it. So uh, we, we just pray that this, uh, this will be a good gospel moment, moment especially those who are around it. Well, let's, let's turn to our lesson here tonight um, in the uh, Gospel of John. Um, let me share my screen with you here. All right, all right. Well, the um, uh, our scripture is John chapter 17, verses one through five. Uh, and it reads from the English Standard Version. Uh, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you since you have given him glory, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you gave him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. May we be blessed by thee. Uh, reading, uh, embracing, and living of God's word. Amen. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that good? All right. Excellent. Good deal. All right. Well, um, uh, just as a start, if, as we turn to our notes, 
Um, it's common for many of us to think of Matthew 6, 9 through 13 and Luke 11, 2 through 4 as the Lord's Prayer. But if we read carefully, it's not the Lord's Prayer. Um, John 17, 1 through 26 is the Lord's Prayer. And this is the one that should be probably called the Lord's Prayer. I would suggest that the uh, Matthew and Luke passages should be referred to as the Disciples Prayer. Okay. Uh, this is where Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray and uh, not so much um, uh, the issue of his prayer himself. Okay, This is where we see a true interaction between Jesus and the Father. We're often told in the gospel that Jesus goes off to pray, but we don't often get the content. We just see that he does. But uh, John here gives us this um, uh, clear conversation that Jesus is having with the Father concerning his mission, why he has come, what he's planned to do. And he defines for us in greater detail things like um, uh, glory, and, and what exactly exactly uh, eternal life is. Okay. Secondly, uh, Matthew 6, uh, um, 9 through 13, and Luke 11, 2 through 4, are better titled the disciples' prayer, as I said, inasmuch as Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. Okay. Uh, John 17 is not a model prayer for us to pray because dare I say, anyone wants to crawl up on a cross for his own sake uh, and experience that, let alone for someone else. Um, also, uh, although I might love the many of you and be willing to be crucified for, me, for you, uh, unfortunately, Sunday morning, you'd still find me in the grave <laughs> and you'd still have your sins uh, to deal with before God. So it's not going to have the same effect. So uh, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray in the Matthew and Luke passage, but Matthew 17 is his own prayer. Uh, many scholars title um, John uh, 17, 1 through, 1 through 26 as the high priestly prayer, although the word high priest is never mentioned. You know, we might say that he's functioning uh, he's functioning uh, in this role, okay? He's uh, functioning in this role. Um, uh, even uh, better, perhaps, uh, let's see, did I give every time, everyone a chance to write this down? Let me slow down a wee bit. Okay. One shot here. This is in the wrong place. Okay. Um, but uh, we are um, seeing that it is a, a high priestly prayer, as some call it. I, I think uh, perhaps another label would go even better. Okay. Uh, because thematically, what Jesus is doing, a good title for the prayer, is a prayer of the advocate. Okay. An, an advocate is someone who goes before God for someone else's benefit, okay, as I'm understanding here. Um, uh, in John's gospel, Jesus used the word paraclete, okay, which uh, some um, Bibles translate this as comforter. But I, I would take issue with this and say, uh, when, when I think of comfort, uh, something that I order off of Amazon to keep me warm uh, in the winter, like it is in Minnesota when it's still uh, cold in the summer where it's warm <laughs> everywhere else, uh, that would be the idea of comforter. But the, 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 the bigger and better idea here uh, is uh, not comforter, it's advocate. Right? And Jesus defines himself as our advocate. And then when he leaves uh, his disciples, he promises to send another advocate, uh, one who will look out for the disciples' interest. Um, uh, 
one who will, uh, will look out for the disciples interest in the same way that he did okay and for ours okay so um, uh, advocate is the better idea and what Jesus is doing here is really his um, self consecration okay he's dedicating himself to this particular cause so it's a prayer of self consecration uh, lifting one's eyes uh, into, it says heave here, but it should read heaven. I need to correct this. Okay. Lifting one's eyes into heaven was a common posture for prayer. Okay. It is a uh, common posture uh, for prayer. Uh, if I could, um, could I ask everyone if they might um, please uh, mute uh, so that we, we don't pick up any um, background noise here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so uh, the the section starts with Jesus um, uh, lifting his eyes to heaven uh, as a and and this posture is a, a posture that's signaling to us uh, that he's praying because otherwise there's nothing in the context like the Greek word presukamai that's suggesting that that's saying that Jesus saying that Jesus is praying. It's that the fact that he's uh, lifting his uh, eyes uh, uh, in this, um, to indicate that he's in a praying posture. Now, uh, once he does this, uh, Jesus announces, my hour has come. And it's best to understand his hour as signifying the close of his public ministry, that that public ministry is over and the onset of his passion culminating in his return, okay? Now, uh, let me uh, uh, illustrate here just a little bit. All through John chapter, uh, John chapters one through 12, we've seen Jesus' public ministry and uh, outside of John 1, 1 through 118, which is really a prologue, but we have Jesus' public ministry. The uh, last aspect of Jesus' public ministry is kind of the healing of uh, the resurrection of Lazarus and then a, uh, a dinner for Jesus uh, after that. But in verse um, uh, chapter 13, okay, through to the end of, uh, let's say, uh, 20, uh, all of this is a relatively short period of time. Okay. Uh, maybe just a wee bit over a week. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, Jesus' public ministry has lasted anywhere from three to five years. So when he talks about his hour, okay, it doesn't mean a literal um, 60 minutes. He means the hour of his passion okay, or his suffering. Uh, and it begins here in chapter 13. In other words, Jesus says, I'm finally on the final leg of my ministry here. And this hour lasts all the way until his return to the Father. Okay, So it, it's that short amount of time. This is my hour has come. Early in John's Gospel, I believe we may have talked about this before, at his first miracle in Cana of Galilee, uh, they ran out of wine. Okay, and by the way, that's like real wine. It's not Welch's grape juice. It's like real wine because the text says that after, usually the way it works is you bring out your best, your Beaujolais, uh, Clos du Bois, and then um, once everyone is loaded, you can bring out the MD 2020 and everyone's taste buds are dead by then. So, so they don't know you serving a bad wine. So, um, uh, so the, the idea is, yeah, uh, people could become inebriated by drinking too much. The Bible doesn't have uh, a moratorium against all drinking. What it has uh, a, um, a disquisition against is becoming drunk. That's the issue. Okay, that's the issue. So um, uh, they run out of wine, which is a shameful thing to happen at a Jewish wedding, to run out of wine. Jesus' mother is involved with this. So apparently, uh, whoever... Uh, the wedding is for, it might be a family member. So his mother wants to, him to fix it. And she says, uh, they've run out of wine. And Jesus responds to her, how is this our problem? And, and then he responds, my hour has not yet come. 
So why is he saying that? He says, okay, basically, uh, I don't want my uh, ministry uh, uh, to be highlighted by my ability to make 180 gallons of the best wine ever, okay, from, from water. Um, so uh, instead, he does it in more of a private way, and it becomes a sign of his glory, uh, a, a sign uh, that something greater is coming, but it's not the event, okay? So, so Jesus is very careful all through John's gospel that moments that were um, sufficient for him to, to serve as do a miracle or, or, or something uh, to be a sign uh, as opposed to making the sign the big event, okay? So, so he didn't want to get the people construed, uh, miscon misconstrued as to what they were believing in. What he really wants them to believe in, in is his death and resurrection, okay? Everything else is, and John is pointing to that. Three to five years of worth of ministry to point to it, and then uh, a, a little over a week or so to really uh, highlight in on this, uh, that he has to be crucified, he has to be lifted up, has to be lifted up from the, from the grave, and he has to be witnessed by his disciples. Okay? Because if the disciples uh, do not see Jesus, they don't really have a solid base for any preaching. Okay? And, and this is going to be critical uh, with uh, uh, Thomas, of course, and um, uh, John chapter 20. Uh, Thomas is not there when Jesus or originally goes into the uh, upper room uh, after he's resurrected. His disciples see him, and Thomas is not there. So Thomas later on says, when, uh, when he comes to the room, uh, the disciples say, hey, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas goes, yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> i tell you what, uh, I'm from Missouri. I'm from the show me state. And until I can put my finger in those wounds and his hands and his side, I will in no way believe. In Greek, that's an emphatic negation. In other words, I I've got to see this. I've got to feel it. And uh, then the text says that the doors were closed, okay? And Jesus showed up <laughs> just in the room and kind of went to Thomas, you mean like this womb right here? And then Thomas said, oh, my Lord and my God, without ever, in John's gospel, without ever touching Jesus. And Jesus had to say to him, uh, was saying that, look, you have to know that I'm resurrected because you're going to have to preach to people who are not going to be able to see me and touch me and talk to me. So your belief uh, uh, in, in what your brothers has told, has, have told you about me should have been sufficient because I'm not going to be following you around all through your ministry for you to say, the Lord Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Oh, Lord, come over here and show him the wounds in your hand. He said, that's not going to be, uh, uh, be possible because I'm going to be with the Father. So testimony is going to be critical here. So uh, this is where I want people to believe. And first of all, you, you 12, okay, minus Judas plus Matthias, and then later on Paul, that testimony is going to have to be solid from you. And if it's not, you have two problems. One, if you're not believing, you've got an eternal life issue, namely you don't have it. And number two, if you don't have eternal life, I'm not going to let you preach about it. And that's the... Uh, problem, I think what a lot of ministry is many people are preaching about eternal life without really knowing what it is, okay? Um, and um, that can lead to a lot of confusion. So the, the hour, when Jesus says, my hour has come, okay, uh, he is, um, we're to best understand that, he says, I'm in the final chapter of my earthly ministry, which I will complete in my death and resurrection, and then uh, I will ascend back to the Father. That's the hour that he speaks of. Okay. Um, uh, one other thing is when Jesus starts this prayer, he uses the term Father, as we see highlighted here. Okay. And this lets us know that it is a very uh, intimate moment. Just this notion of Father. He's inviting um, us to share with, uh, with him this vital relationship as God as Father. Jews didn't really pray a lot with the idea of in the Old Testament and even in the, the uh, period between the time the Old and the New Testament was written, 
calling God Father. Okay, they, they didn't really do a lot of that. But here, uh, Jesus is doing that because uh, what he's about to say uh, in this prayer is a very intimate toward the uh, Father and also uh, toward the end of this is intimate, very intimate toward us. We won't have time to go through the whole uh, of the prayer tonight, but I, I wanted to make sure that we got on this particular part. Okay, so the reason why Jesus asked the Father to glorify him was so that he could glorify the Father, okay? Glorify your son that your son might glorify you. Notice that Jesus didn't ask for anything for himself, okay? Uh, he, he's, he, he, the, the request here is like so. Okay. What he is asking for is to that the son be glorified so that the son can in return glorify the father and that the benefits of what he's doing on the cross could be transferred to those who believe. So he, he, he doesn't ask for anything for himself. The, the glory that he wants uh, and, and we'll explain this in just a second. The glory that he wants is uh, the glory that he will need to in turn glorify the Father. His entire ministry uh, is tied up in uh, his vision uh, and his focus on doing what the Father has sent him to do. So Jesus' death, resurrection, and exaltation uh, or uh, these things are what glorifies the Father. So when, when we call, when we talk about this word glory, uh, in the Old Testament, it is the word kavod. Okay. And uh, in the Old Testament, the idea of glory has to do with the weight of something. It comes from a, a, a root that talks about something's weightiness. But in the New Testament, okay, this is OT, the word from, for glory in Greek is doxa. And this has to do with the manifestation of something. Uh, these uh, ideas kind of uh, uh, overlap. Uh, Paul has one place where he talks about the eternal weight of glory. He's combining the ideas. So when he says glory here, what he's, what he's referring to is a visible manifestation of majesty. a vis visible manifestation of majesty through acts of power. So the visible uh, um, at a, uh, manifestation of God's majesty through acts of power. And you say, what, what power are we speaking of what act of power? Well, it's um, bound up this way. The death, the resurrection, and the exaltation of Jesus. And all of these are very critical, but where they're really leading is that um, God, through Christ, can grant eternal life. And that is... If we can, if we can sum up, what is this act of power? It's the granting of eternal life. What does it require? Death, resurrection, exaltation. Lift it up on the cross, lift it up from the grave, lift it up into heaven. Okay. All right. So, um, so this will bring glory to uh, this will bring glory uh, to the Father. Okay. The authority that the Father granted to the Son 
was the authority to judge. The authority that the father granted to the son was the authority to judge. But the interesting thing that the son does is not judge, but allows the judgment to be placed on himself. Okay. Um, if we could do this quickly here, John 3, 16. Okay, we know this passage well. For, um, for in this manner, God loved the world that he gave his uh, one of a kind unique, is the way I would translate this, only begotten, not the best translation there, uh, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have uh, eternal life. Uh, for God did not send this son into the world to condemn the world, and the word is actually judge, but here he meant in the sense of condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. How? By allowing the judgment to fall on himself, the son. And he says, whoever believes in the son is not condemned. Why? Because the son has died at death to pay for uh, sins. And whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one of a kind, unique son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world. And uh, men or people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Okay, because their works were evil. So um, uh, Jesus then here is uh, uh, seeking uh, to, uh, to not come and condemn the world, uh, but uh, provide a means by which the, uh, the world might be saved, contingent upon their uh, belief uh, that he has come from the for Father to do this very thing. Right. So um, let me go back here. Through Jesus, excuse me, though Jesus has the authority of all humanity, not all humanity would be granted eternal life. Okay? Uh, only those who respond. Mm -hmm. okay. He has the, uh, the uh, power over all humanity. Okay? Uh, but only those who respond okay, uh, are going to be the ones uh, who benefit from it. Only those who respond. Right. So, um, all right. So Jesus will then define uh, this idea of eternal life. Now, all my life when I was growing up as a kid, when I heard eternal life, I immediately thought of living forever, okay? That's part of the idea of eternal life, uh, but um, uh, it, it, it's not the best expression of what it means to have uh, eternal life. Uh, what, what, what is eternal life? Now, John 17, 3, uh, in John 17, 3, Jesus defines eternal life, not simply as a long duration of existence, but as a quality of life that comes from being in relationship with the Father and Jesus Christ, whom the Father sent. is a uh, life um, that uh, uh, comes from being in relationship with the Father and uh, with Jesus Christ. So let's talk about this just for a second. Okay. Here Jesus says, and this is eternal life. Now, something that we cannot see in the English text because of how we express this idea, eternal life, is that the word the in the Greek, uh, for you who are students of the Greek, it's right there. It's the feminine article, hey, it's modifying life. The text actually doesn't say, and this is eternal life. It says, this is the eternal life. You, you follow what I'm saying? This is the eternal life. Um, so it, it's not speaking in general. Uh, it, it's saying that eternal life specifically, particular, particularly, is this thing right here. And Jesus introduces this comment, this statement with, uh, he could have just said eternal life is, but he says, now this is the eternal life, so that he can um, uh, basically highlight this. And John writes this in a way that it highlights it. So we'll say, well, well, what is 
the eternal life. Everywhere else in John, where the phrase eternal life happens, the word the never stands in front of it. Only in this place. Okay? Only in this place. Uh, and when he qualifies it, because uh, number one, Judaism already has the notion of eternal life in it. Okay? Uh, in other words, uh, in the, they, they see that this age, and we'll do this again here. The current age that we're in, go here. Then at the end of history, there is a, a, a great event. So the end of the age comes. Okay. Like remember when Matthew says, uh, I will be with you even to the end of the age. This, this would be the notion. Now, after this, this notion of the eternal life starts. Okay. So this is already in Judaism. Okay. Remember the, uh, the rich young ruler, sort of a good inflation there, but asked Jesus, how might I, how might I obtain eternal life? Okay. So they already had this notion there. The, the Pharisees are all waiting for it. They need Messiah to come to uh, restore Israel to its former glory. And then the eternal life will start. So this notion is already there. Is everyone following what I'm saying? The notion of eternal life is there before Jesus ever brings it up. Okay. But the issue is, what exactly is it? Okay. What exactly is it? So, uh, so when, it's, when he says, this is the eternal life, if you're a Pharisee, you're saying, okay, we must keep Torah. And then when Messiah comes, you know, he'll defeat the Gentiles restore the kingdom to Israel, then there'll be universal obedience of, to the Torah, and eternal life will start, okay? So the way that you were to gain it was by reading the scriptures, uh, knowing, the, knowing uh, the, the scriptures, being obedient there, and that would usher you into eternal life, okay? Which, which in Matthew's gospel, this eternal life is called the kingdom, okay? So everyone already has their idea of eternal life and how it's go how we're going to get there. End of the age comes. That's what the big uh, mark here that that God would break into history. Messiah would come. Uh, Israel would be restored to its uh, uh, former glory and beyond. The nations would come to the mountain of the Lord uh, and would have to admit that Yahweh is, is God. That the the new David will be established as king. See, they already had that. So when Jesus is praying here, what he's saying with the word thee is this is the real eternal life. This is how it's given, okay? It, it, it's not something that you can graduate uh, simply from being a good Jew and graduate into this. And he says, no. He says, the eternal life, okay, uh, first of all, is this, that they know you, referring to the Father, okay, that they know you. Uh, now, a, a, any Jew would say, well, we already know God, okay? Uh, it, it's just like church folks who, right before they cuss you out, they argue you how, how much they know God. And they've been at church all their lives, and I'm sitting in the same seat that my grandmother sit in, you know, and whatever, and they really know God, but they'll give you a piece of their mind, and it's the bad piece in just a minute. Uh, so, uh, so they'll boast in kind of knowing God. So just in the same way that the Jews would say, oh, we, we know God. Uh, he's the, uh, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, our forefathers, okay? Now, so Jesus says, no, that true eternal life it is not based on heritage, okay? But it's based on the, they, the fact that they know you, okay? And Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Okay? So, say, wait a minute. 
So we already have thoughts on what eternal life is. Jesus says, well, you're wrong. Okay? Eternal life uh, is a matter of the, the knowledge of God. It said that they know you, and it says the, the, the true God, the only true God. Um, and another way of saying that is the only real God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Now, this and here is very important because it's just not the claim to know God. Uh, that would make this too general, but it's and Jesus Christ whom you sent. In other words, you've sent Jesus Christ to make yourself known in such a way that if you deny Jesus Christ, if you, if you, if you do not have the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and embrace him. It, Jesus says, neither do you know the Father. No one comes to the Father except by me. Okay, so, so uh, that's the picture, that they know you and Jesus Christ whom you sent. My mom, my, not my, my, my mom, but my wife goes to a, uh, a, a salon here, and the, the lady that uh, does her uh, eyebrows, nails, and things like that is uh, a Muslim. And the uh, lady said, I was always saying to my wife, I said, well, you know, we all worship the same God. And my wife goes, no, we don't, uh, because um, the God I worship has revealed himself through Jesus Christ. Okay? And Jesus is not just a prophet. He's literally the son of God. He's died for our sins. He was raised on the third day, and he sits at the right hand of the Father right now serving uh, as our advocate and as the manager of the completion of time. So he's exclusive in that sense, uh, that he is uh, God and very God uh, in the flesh. Okay? And she said, that, that's not your God. Uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, the lady's um, son, they, they're from Pakistan. The lady's son uh, told her, I think last Christmas, she said, Mom, I, I want to celebrate Christmas. And she said, uh, no, baby, we don't celebrate Christmas. He said, we're from Pakistan and we're Muslims. And the, and the, the seven-year-old said, no, mom, you're from Pakistan. You're a Muslim. <laughs> I'm an American and I want to celebrate Christmas and Jesus because there's gift giving behind all of this. So, so he's ready to throw off the old religion and say, I'm in a new plan, a new place, and, and uh, I, I'm going to serve a different God. And he said, she said, if my parents knew this, they'd be losing their minds because he's over here in America and he's picking up American ways and he's picking up the Christian God. And, and the kid said, no, 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 that's for the old world. I, I'm here. Uh, I, w I want Jesus and Christmas gifts. That's, that, that's what's going to go on. So um, uh, that, that point there is uh, this that they know you and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That and is a very important part because it is, it is not saying that it's simply enough just to know God in some ambiguous way. It says, no, God as he has identified himself through what he's done through Jesus Christ, his son. Okay, so that and is also could, could be said like this, that they know you uh, and Jesus Christ whom you sent that all might know you, okay? And this is part of what Jesus is saying in this particular prayer. It, it says, I've done the work. I have made you known to those who are yours, starting with the disciples, all right? Now, another thing, this word for know here, It's just not mental awareness. Okay. So that's the beginning of it. You have to be made aware. But the idea of, of knowledge here comes from this Hebrew word, yada, the Y A nine D A, like so. Okay. And uh, this uh, knowledge here is an intimate knowledge. This is the same word that's used in the Old Testament when a man knows his wife. In other words, to have intimate relations with her and then she'd bear a song. Well, it's the same word here, but it's used in an even uh, deeper way that it is the uh, knowledge of God in terms of 
who he is, how he is, what he wants. And if you have this knowledge, it governs how you behave and how you think. Okay, so it, it, it's like the, uh, a person um, standing on the uh, edge of a high mountain and you say, hey, be careful. You do know about gravity, don't you? And they say, yeah, but then they keep tap dancing and frolicking around up there. And you think, no, you don't understand gravity that in a minute you keep doing that, you're going to be snatched downward to the rocks at 32 feet per second. All right. Uh, so if you if you really know gravity, then you govern yourself accordingly because you'd know that you're in a precarious place. Uh, to know God and to have him revealed uh, for who he really is means that once you see this and once you know him, the only proper response is submission. Okay? So if you're aware of God and then not submission, and see, this is what bothered me, bothers me about this Christian nationalism that goes on. I say, oh, you know, we're a Christian nation, and, blah, blah. and then you turn around and hate someone. Okay, wait a minute. God didn't allow that among his people, and he uh, didn't even uh, uh, allow the hatred of strangers of those who were at a disadvantage in their society. Remember, uh, when, when, when God um, reveals himself to Israel, when he makes himself known through Torah, one of the things he teaches is, remember what it was like to be a slave in Egypt? And everyone would go, yeah. He says, well, then don't you dare treat anyone that way when you have the advantage and someone else is a foreigner coming through or someone else is among you, but within fewer numbers, you be very careful, okay? How you treat them because you should know what it means to be on the disadvantage. And if you really know me, when the, when the stranger comes in and he doesn't have any rights, and whatever, you will protect and guard him. So that will be a sign that, that you know my people, yeah, that you are my people. Now, remember when Abraham went down into Egypt you know, on his first trip there, and he's you know, married to um, Sarah, which is you know, technically kind of his half-sister, <laughs> but he has this uh, speech where he says, look, baby, uh, we're about to go down here to Egypt, and these people are crazy. They have no fear of God, which means they don't have any conscience. And if they found out that you are my wife, I'm going to have an accident, okay? Or I'm going to be accidented, I mean, mafia style. And then you're going to be available to be married to someone else. And this whole thing of, you know, um, uh, that uh, uh, I'm going to have a seed and, and all that. So that's going to go bye-bye in the car car. So you tell them that you're my sister and everything will be cool, all right? So uh, Abraham's uh, reason is they do not, uh, when they go, they go down and of course, Abraham says, this is my sister. And Pharaoh goes, then you don't mind if, if a brother dates your sister there. And Abraham is probably going, oh, uh, no, uh, yeah, I kind of, but if I say something, I'm going to be in trouble. Well, of course, uh, Pharaoh takes uh, Sarah uh, into his harem uh, to become one of his wives. Now, this is going to work out bad if God promises Abraham and Sarah that uh, the seed will come through Sarah and then Pharaoh fathers the child, then God goes, look, I have a problem with that because I didn't ask uh, Pharaoh to be the surrogate father here. This is supposed to be your child. So what the Lord does is kind of while Pharaoh is sleeping, he kind of slips a little videotape uh, in his dream and say, if you touch this woman, this is what's going to happen to you. And of course, Pharaoh goes <laughs> back to Abraham and said, dude, why didn't you tell me this was your wife? And Abraham's re response was, because I didn't think that you had a fear of God down here. And this is Yerat Elohim, not Yerat Adonai. It's not the same thing as the fear of the Lord that we find in the book of Proverbs. That's a different concept. Fear of God means you don't have a conscience, okay? That if you, you know, kill me, uh, take my wife, take my property, it, it, it doesn't bother you, all right? So the, the point when Yahweh made himself known to his people, to know Yahweh is to say, we're, we can't be that type of people because Yahweh will not allow it. And see, that should say a lot uh, any country that claims that it has Christians in it, okay, especially where the Christians are part of the dominant culture, 
then you, you, you can't say that you can allow the mistreatment of people, whether they're believers or not, uh, because there are more of you than them and because you don't want them there. You're not welcoming. And the, the scripture says, no. Okay, if, if you're God's people, this is not the way that you behave. Okay, because that shows a lack of hospitality. In the book of uh, Revelation, uh, chapter uh, 11, the two witnesses of God show up. And what happens? They're killed and left in the street. Well, the, part of the reason why God puts judgment on the mystical city that is called you know, Sodom, which is actually Jerusalem, he, he puts judgment on Jerusalem because they did not receive his witnesses with hospitality. They were outnumbered. Uh, and instead of receiving them, they killed them. Sodom and Gomorrah, same thing. It wasn't just this uh, the homosexual acts that was judged. That was the way that they showed disrespect to the visitors, the two angels, and that God, God was making them pay uh, because they were about to assault, assault his, his uh, two angels. Uh, and the, but the way that they were going to do it were through these grotesque sexual acts. So uh, they could have just, uh, you know, been like in Revelation, tried to kill them, and it would have been the same thing, you know, boom, boom, flat, dusty, and glowing in the dark uh, for Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, so then um, the, uh, the dynamic there uh, is to, if, if I know God and I really know him, if I have an intimate knowledge with him, it causes me to govern myself a certain way, all right? So this knowledge, okay, Jesus possesses. And his goal is to give that to us. Okay. Such that true life is the knowledge of God that brings you into intimate fellowship with God that as his children, okay, through accepting Jesus Christ, it is a knowledge of God to where the children and their relationship to, to the Father is represented by one of love and obedience. That we follow, Jesus has already have this, and what I have, I want to give to you. However, it's gonna cost me to get it to you. Okay, it has to go through a cross. I hope everyone understands. So what eternal life is, and this is why, why um, uh, John, I, I, on the words of Jesus, he will say, this is the eternal life, okay? And the eternal life is an intimate knowledge of the Father. Mm -hmm. okay? Not just eternal life, but the eternal life. Of all the ways eternal life can be defined, you know, is it according to Judaism? Just keep the Torah and things will work out. Jesus says, no. Uh, I replace, I fulfill Torah. Okay, that's my role. If you know the, want to know the Father, you come through me. Uh, John chapter two, um, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. I mean, you mean the stone temple? Jesus, no. He says, no, I mean the temple that is me. If you want to meet God, you have to come here where the sacrifice is being offered, not on this temple. Okay, the, the temple is simply play acting uh, what is designed to really point toward the reality of what I'm going to do. Okay, it's a shadow. I'm the body that's casting the shadow. Quit worshiping the shadow and worship the, uh, the, the one who's casting the shadow. Okay, so, um, so e e eternal life is a relationship with God through the Son. Okay, it's an intimate relationship that is reflected in, in godliness. And, pick up my, my step here. So John 17, three helps to clarify what Jesus meant in John uh, 10, 10. I have come so that they may have life and have it more abundantly, okay? This is not about prosperity gospel, uh, except the real prosperity is a relationship with the father. It's not about getting more things in this world, okay? Uh, th that's a misappropriation of what, um, uh, John has done with this concept of life, which is the, the Greek word zoe here. Um, uh, zoe, okay, uh, it, when it speaks of life here, this equals relationship with the Father.
through salvation. And how does the salvation come? Through Jesus Christ. Okay. And, and someone might say, but I thought salvation is where we live forever. Yeah, you do, because the nature of the relationship is a permanent relationship, okay, of, of God um, glorifying the work of the Son and us, and we return to God, love and obedience, and then God gives more life, and, more, and, and we're forever in this cycle of him blessing and us returning it with, um, with love and obedience, that, that we're radically loyal in the same way that Jesus is, that we have the, the life of Christ in us, uh, and also we have the death to sin and uh, disrespect and disobedience to God. Jesus killed that on the cross, and, and our claim is that's where our disrespect and obedience dies too, okay? So we've entered into this new life. It's wonderful now, but it's going to even get better when Jesus returns and removes us from this body of sin. So, so that way we won't even have negative thoughts interrupted the good that we want. So that is the hope of the glory of God. As, as Paul says in Romans, we boast upon the hope of glory of God when sin is no longer able to interfere or impede any of our thoughts or actions toward God. And that's really what eternal life is. It's the life of the next age. But John emphasizes that that life starts now with the engagement of trusting in Jesus Christ. So the abundant life is relationship with God, who is the fountain of spiritual nourishment, okay? Uh, to be near God and to have God uh, present with us. Uh, I would go back again to Genesis. Remember when he tells Adam in the day that you eat of this tree, that basically the day that you obey me, you will surely die. Well, as we read in the story of Genesis, we say, well, God didn't tell the truth because Adam didn't die. So the problem is not that Adam didn't die. The problem is we don't understand death. The cardinal idea behind death is not ceasing to exist. It's distance from God. Okay. Uh, Adam is there in the garden. Okay. And let this be the, the garden here. Uh, he's there in the garden, he and Eve. Okay. So they're in God's pleasant presence, they're near his wisdom, they're, they're near his love, they live in a place called abundance. Uh, yeah, gardens were ultimately designed for the gods to, um, uh, to dwell uh, in ancient Near Eastern literature, but in the Bible story, God and his images both dwell in this garden sanctuary or temple. So, uh, so to be here with God is life. But to be expelled is death. Okay? Just like for Israel, to be in the promised land is life. But when they had to go to Babylon, uh, the, the psalmist and others, they reckoned that as, this is like us being dead. They were, why? We, we can't worship. We can't do any things. And our captors are saying, sing us one of those good old Israeli spirituals. And they go like, how can we when we're here? Okay, so, so, so death is being driven out from the presence of God, okay? Uh, and, and sooner or later, this catches up uh, to humans also with physical death, okay? Which basically puts a, a stop to this horrible existence uh, of, of being distant from God. Now, the only way to get back to God is through a blood sacrifice, not of an animal, but for human. And what Jesus does is starts here, comes as a human, enters into death, and then goes back to the Father. Okay? So that the one who believes in him uh, then ex experiences, okay, experience this shift of this movement from this place of distance from God back to life. Okay. All right. 
So, um, so what Jesus' death does uh, is to uh, pay for the consequences of sin here, uh, and then moves in his resurrection. When he goes back to God, that means that if we believed in him, we get to be with God too. And that's why the Bible story ends. Well, even before that, when we believe we're sealed with the spirit, God says it's safe to dwell in there now. And we say, well, safe for whom? And God goes, safe for you, because otherwise, if I show up without a sacrifice for your sins uh, uh, and, and without a cleansing that allows me to be present in you, you really die. <laughs> okay, You're going to die in ways that you don't even want to know about. OK, so so Jesus is is clearing that up. So when he says that uh, that in him was life and the life was the light for men, Jesus is that life. He reveals how do you get back to God? The answer is through me. No other way. Okay. All right. So uh, let me pick this up a little bit. I'm, I've been explaining a whole lot here, but the uh, abundant life consists of radical dedication to God as seen in Jesus' sacrificial death. Okay. So uh, uh, abundant life is this idea of radical dedication to God. Okay. That's when you really know that you have it, when what comes out of the other side of your trust is obedience. Okay. So uh, intimate uh, relational knowledge of God is what the son imparts. Um, the son was the one who was in the intimate fellowship with God in the beginning uh, and is the sole and exclusive agent who explains or, or makes the father known. Okay? This is um, uh, John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time, but the one-of-a-kind, unique God who is in the bosom of the father he has explained, okay? And, and also John 1.1, 1, 1, when it says, uh, and the word was with God, okay? This phrase, kai, uh, hologos, cross, ton, the on, as we read it. And the word was with God means, and the word was face to face and and the meaning of that idiom is an intimate fellowship with God and this should be understood as with God the Father So in a sense, what salvation is, is Jesus sharing his intimate relationship with the Father with us. Okay, that, that's huge, because that means that everything that's coming to him, reigning forever, uh, risen from the dead, judging angels, all of that, everything that he's entitled to, we're entitled to. If he's predestined for something, then if we're in him, then we're predestined for that also. Everyone follow anything that God has promised to Christ now, because Jesus is becoming human, because he, he gave his life up to God sacrificially for our benefit, um, because he's been faithful in this regard, uh, everything then that God promises to, to him accrues to us because we find ourselves in him. And, and what God wants is, imagine this, a whole planet full of people who love him like Jesus loves him, and guess what? Who love each other like Jesus loves us. See, that's what the church should be about, the business of, is putting that on display now. And, and, and see, that, that makes the beauty of, you know, a church doesn't have to have black or white members or they are all mixed in, but they have to have this life in it. You know, if it's a multicultural church, all the better. But the, the beautiful thing is when a black Christians, white Christians, Hispanic Christians, Pakistani, when they all have that same witness and love for each other and say, I know you, I know your story. God has done the same thing in you that he's doing in us. Isn't it wonderful? And, and see, that's supposed to be the thing that the world is supposed to look in and say, why do these people get over racism and we don't? 
And then we say the answer is Christ in us, the hope of glory. The glory of God is seen now in this wonderfully diverse community that has the same heart and passion toward him. And when they see another person with a different color, different eyes, different hair, they'll say, man, isn't the, the, the glory, ingenuity, and wisdom of God, isn't it just ingenious, okay, uh, that, that he makes us in all these different ways but yet we all reflect his glory. And the fact that we're different is designed to contribute to the glory because we, we, we have diversity among us, but we don't have distance because of the difference. Why? Because we're all in Christ. That, that he's the one who really, who really determines what all of our lives mean. Otherwise, we'd all be people of different colors on our way to hell. Who wants that in common? <laughs> you know, and, and instead of saying we're going to display what the future world is going to be in the now, we have the eternal life and it's growing in us more and more each day. And the world should be looking at that going, wow. Or hating us because we are doing it. Okay, but, but if we follow the world's worldliness, then we, we, we are no longer an adequate witness to, to what God is doing through Christ in us and in humanity. So uh, it is Jesus hour in Jesus hour his death, resurrection and exaltation that he makes the father's grace and forgiveness known. In other words, he's saying, when you look at me, you, you can see the father's heart. He's sacrificing the son to a world that loves darkness so that the world might be saved through the son to provide an avenue of, of coming all the way from death, going through the cross with, without ever having to be crucified yourselves because you participate in my crucifixion and my resurrection. The only way to gain this knowledge is through belief in the Son. It, you, you just can't generally say God because God says, I've identified myself through Jesus. He says, well, well, we want you, but without Jesus, he goes, if you, if you are willing to insult your, my son, that means you insult me because my son was my idea. So if you're in, and see, this is the, the, the problem, even with the Jewish leaders, they'll say, well, we know God, he is our father, um, but, but not you. And Jesus goes, if you love the father, you would love me. Um, but the truth is, since you don't love me, guess who else you don't love? And anyway, he's not your father. Your father's the devil. Okay, and you do his works. That's why you're murderous the way you are. Okay, to get rid of me, because otherwise, if you were if you were truly God's people and you thought I was a crack pot, you would just say uh, people will lose interest in him after a while. We don't have to kill him over that. Okay, but but you 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 don't you don't recognize me because you've never really known the Father. And, and here's the irony: <laughs> it's like Jesus goes, "You guys come to this temple three times a year and you you celebrate it." And you, you kind of ring the father's doorbell, but he hasn't been here since the days of Ezekiel when the Shekinah glory left. He's not even home. And you're worshiping in this building and you don't know the God who lives here or, or who lived here. And that's why you don't know his son. Who knows him? The poor, the meek, even those who are rich, who are willing to say, everything that I have, Lord, is, is yours anyway. That means nothing. And what I want is you, the Joseph of Arimathea's of the world, uh, those people. And otherwise, the poor, the desperate, says they get me uh, because they don't have the world's devices or even God's religion with your interpretation on it to prop them up. So that, that's the problem. So, so you've hijacked God's word and you're using it to your own end. And, and as you read it, uh, uh, John 5.39 is a good verse to know. Um, Jesus says uh, to the Jewish leaders, you search the scriptures because you think that they contain eternal life, but they are talking about me. I'm eternal life. Okay. I am the life. Okay. Uh, and, and I am the, the way to the father. Uh, I'm the revealer. I, I am everything that the, that the father wants expressed in bodily form. So although at this point, uh, Jesus uh, has finished his mission, he speaks of completing the work in a fashion that demonstrates full loyalty to God and his intention 
to be obedient to the end. He says, yes, I've completed my work so far. I've done everything that you've asked me to do. There's one final piece left, and it's as good as done. Okay. Uh, and if you look at uh, John 12, 27, uh, you can read 26 and 27 for this. But uh, Jesus is basically saying here, my hour has come. He says, and what do I say now? You know, Father, spare me from this hour. He says, it's for this reason that I came into the world in the first place. Okay. I came here to do this. So what am I going to say now? Oh, no, no, I, don't, I can't go. I'm too afraid. He goes, no, uh, it, it's, it's not even about what I want. It's what the Father wants. That's it, period. Uh, that's the fuel that drives me. The sacrifice of Jesus, I have uh, three more slides of this one. The sacrifice of Jesus involves both the Father's giving of the Son and the Son's uh, self-sacrifice to the Father. And all of this is for our benefit. Okay? So the, the act of salvation is actually a transaction that the father is giving the son and the son is giving himself, excuse me, to the father in sacrifice to benefit believers. Okay. So we can think of this as on Calvary, uh, what's going on is Jesus is serving as a sacrificial lamb. You say, well, the high priest is the one who usually cuts the lamb's throat. That's God's role. The, the father at Calvary is basically the father serving as the high priest, and he's using the Jews and the Romans as the knife and to, to cut the son's throat, basically, if we use it. So Calvary is actually God worshiping with God and then giving us the benefits. Uh, all throughout Israel's history, you know, you had a, a, the high priest and, uh, and then you had the, the lamb, and God says, you guys are shadows. When this when this comes to reality, it's going to be me and my son, and you get the benefit of it, and we'll share the benefits of that with you through the Holy Spirit. So once you have the Spirit, everything that we've done accrues to you. So Jesus now prays again that the Father will glorify him uh, with the glory that Jesus was enjoying before the world was, okay, uh, and before the world was created. So basically what happens is if we look at this line as kind of coming from eternity, what Jesus does is to enter into time and space and then goes back to the Father and then continues this ministry here of being with the Father, which he describes as glory, okay? He says uh, he shares that uh, with, um, with the Father before time and then in the future, and then there's another glory that's here that speaks of uh, the glory seen in God's compassion. Okay. Uh, now, let's say Jesus doesn't come. Then that means he can go simply from glory to glory, okay, like so. and we never be included on it. So, but what happens in Jesus' incarnation and ascension is when he becomes a human and dies on the cross, he makes it possible for when he goes back to that uh, glory and splendor and power and majesty that he shares with the Father, he makes a detour in history so that right here he can pick us up and take us back and enjoy what he was enjoying with the father before the world was created. It, it, isn't that incredible? <laughs> In other words, he comes off the road uh, into to the, the podunk areas, uh, picks up all of us and takes us back to the main glory highway uh, so that we can enjoy what he's enjoyed before creation and then in the future. So finally, the request, this request asserts that again, the pre-existence of Jesus, the glory that I, I was enjoying with you before the world was, he did not uh, originate as part of this creation, 
but he, but himself, the agent of creation, uh, and had entered creation, uh, not because he was created with creation, but to save it. Yeah, just like the, the, the map that I just showed you here. So when, when the creation falls into collapse here, into the, the red box of judgment, Jesus enters in that so that uh, because John says he was part of what created all of this in the first place. He's the agent. Uh, the, all things came into being through the word, and that was, that was Christ. He's the agent of creation. Now he comes in it to save it so it can go and continue with God on a track of glory. And this is what this is what he's praying for. He says, "This is what I've come to do, and uh, now I'm I'm ready to complete this leg and come back to you, and uh, and when I do, that's when I'll be able to fully share all of the benefits of my accomplishment." Now I've ran over again this week. I hope this has been some uh, good and interesting teaching to bring some new uh, insights to you. But uh, I want to uh, stop at this point and see if anyone has any questions over the verses that we've covered tonight. I knew I could count on you, Brother Alfred. <laughs> well, thank you again for your, uh, your in-depth sharing. A uh, couple of questions. One is you talked about uh, the fear of God earlier and you talked about it uh, in terms of God, not Elohim. Yes. Uh, and, then, uh, and then subsequently another relationship of fear of God with Adonai. Uh, wow. And, and, and what I gathered you, you were um, relating to us was that from that notwithstanding the notion of at some points having a conscience mm -hmm. about good or evil, there is one way of relating to the, the laws of speeding because, you know, um, it says 55 and I'll go to whatever. But, mm -hmm. but there's an elevation, it almost sounds like you were talking about, ele elevation of understanding in the Adonai thing, which maybe is now more like the wisdom of living as opposed to simply the wisdom of good outcomes as, a, from, from, as opposed to conscience about it. I, or am I? Right. It, it, you? Yes, you, you're on the right track. Uh, Proverbs 1.7 and uh, we also find that, you know, fear the Lord in um, uh, uh, Psalm 19. Uh, so this phrase here, I'll start with the fear of God. If I were to put this in, hold on, I think my pen just retired on it. I shouldn't have. I was always busy when something was about to get good. Give me about 15 seconds here. Uh, I'll explain. This phrase that I wrote to the uh, left here in Hebrew, fear of God, yirat Elohim, uh, means that a person has a conscience. Okay? It's, it's a general term. Okay. Uh, this is a general term, fear of God. That simply means that you have a conscience. Anyone can have that. Okay. Now, in Proverbs 1 7, it does not say fear of God. It says fear of the Lord. Okay. And the word that I have there for Lord, notice how I wrote it L and then all of the letters are capital. Okay. Whenever your English Bible does that, that means that the word Yahweh is behind it. When it's L-O-R-D, capital L, then little O, little R, little D, that means the word Adonai is there, which is just a general term for Lord, okay? But if it's all caps like I did, I've done here, that means Yahweh. So the fear of the Lord in Proverbs is the fear of Yahweh, okay? That's the Lord's covenant name, okay? So the fear of the Lord is different from just the idea of a conscience, the fear of the Lord contains two elements. One, that Yahweh, that the Lord, has spoken via his word. 
Okay. In other words, he's communicated his will. All right. And then secondly, is that the, the hearer of that word responds in awe and submission. Okay. Because when he responds in awe and submission, another word for this is faith that leads to obedience. Okay. Because this is proof that you really know the Lord. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, so it, it's proof that you really know the Lord. These two are different in that this comes in covenant relationship with the Lord. That, that there is a there's a treaty between you and the Lord where he provides protection, wisdom, and guidance, and you provide loyalty, which is the key idea behind love in the Old Testament. You shall love the Lord your God. Uh, love there means that you are loyal to him in spite of what your emotions might say. Okay, your emotions might say, I don't feel like forgiving this person, but you say, but Lord, not, not my will, but yours. You see how that, uh, how that works? Say, I, I, I forgive because you, you command me to. And the person said, well, I'm not sincere if I do that. I said, no, the greatest form of sincerity is submission. Okay, because otherwise your emotions get to weigh as much as God's will does. And God goes, how's, how's that going to work in the grand scheme of the universe? And where were you uh, when, I, um, uh, when I formed all of this and your wisdom wasn't here? So um, the issue of, uh, of conscience that becomes a mandate or morals or morality, yeah. um, I'm, I guess I'm trying to, to, uh, to interpret what you said as the difference between that kind of moral outcome, because it's somehow or another, it's, it's, it's the human wisdom about you know, it doesn't make sense to do certain things as opposed to uh, right. the relationship, the, the wisdom of God that then, as you say, uh, submission, obedience, uh, it's an elevation from conscience. Right. Yeah. It's just uh, conscience is, uh, is your relative values mm -hmm. regarding good and evil. Okay. It doesn't mean that it's informed by God's word. Right. Okay. But, but in, in general, if you would go to, you would look at uh, Vladimir Putin and say, this guy has no conscience. Okay. Why? It doesn't bother him to roll into someone else's land with a tank, start blowing up everything. And, and in the ancient world, they, they would say, you have no fear of God. Okay. Because remember, everyone back then was deist back then, and they had some idea that God would judge right and wrong, mm -hmm. okay? And, um, and, and that, that was the property of gods and kings to judge what was right and what was wrong. So in, in societies that were deistic, and if you did something like things like this, the phrase that would be used to you is, don't go there, wow, man, so they don't have a fear of God, okay? Because they have no um, qualms about, you know, uh, mistreating you, robbing you, killing you, abusing you, whatever. Because there's nothing governing their conscience that say there'll be payback if this happens. Okay. And, and that's how Abraham felt about uh, Egypt. So they have laws for Egyptians, but I'm not Egyptian. Okay. So once I get down there, they can do anything to me. Okay. So uh, the, the fear of the, uh, uh, the fear of the Lord, fear of Yahweh here in Proverbs 7, it says is Rashid Da'at in Hebrew. It is the beginning of knowledge, okay? And that knowledge is that word that we've been using. It's, it's the noun form, da'at, okay? It says, once you have this, it says, you don't even, you can't have this knowledge unless the Lord reveals to you first what his will is, okay? Uh, so 
uh, to to know the to, to be exposed to the Lord and not <coughs> respect him for who he is and who he reveals himself. He said that it, it, uh, uh, Solomon says that that's that's a fool, first class fool. They despise wisdom and instruction. Okay, so um, okay, and this is the word that. Uh, Da'at, it comes from the same root, yada, that we've been, that, that they know you, the only real God, okay? Uh, and if you know God, then you govern uh, uh, here. What the gospel does to this is Yahweh, uh, the Lord has revealed, um, uh, ha, uh, has spoken, okay, uh, through his word. Well, what does John call Jesus? The Logos. Okay. He's the ultimate. He's not just a message, he, the medium, the messenger, and the messenger are all one and the same, okay? So to, to reject the Logos here is, is to utterly be a fool because this word leads to life and uh, salvation that leads to life. Make sense? Yes. Yeah, and, and uh, um, to know that God has offered his son, and that's a serious issue, as an expression of his love to redeem you when otherwise you don't, you don't have any redemption capital walking around just with you uh, is to know he's that powerful. And yet his answer to sin against himself is to sacrifice his son. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, he does respond in judgment, but he directs the judgment on his son that those who are in disobedience to him, might find fellowship with him through the sun and through said, what a weird way to, you know, so, so, you know, we say, well, uh, if you don't obey, obey God, there's going to be hell to pay. And Jesus goes, yes. And I do hell part one. You can either do hell with me or you can do hell part two, which is you and God just, you know, we, without me in the middle of it, then, you know, pay me now, pay God now or pay later. But if you pay now, I pay for you. If you pay later, you know, you, that's the do-it-yourself kit. Okay. Um, so uh, so the, the gospel is the ultimate reinterpretation of, of Proverbs 1-7, is that God has revealed himself through Jesus. Okay. And, and, and the only proper response then is awe and submission with the grace, the love, the forgiveness, and all of that things that can't, all those things, and the judgment that goes toward him, and the response needs to be one of awe, submission, love, loyalty. And God says, yes, that's what I was trying to build in the first place. I, I want a kingdom of people like this. I just have two more mundane, real, I think, Good. simple things. Uh, did you intentionally stop short uh, as you were discussing John 1.1? 1, 1, did you intentionally stop short of, and the word was God? Uh, well, let's just put it this way. There was enough in these five verses here just to talk, but but Kaihalogos um, and excuse me, Kaihalos and Halogos, and everything that God was was uh, the Word was. That verse one gives us um, three pictures of who the Logos is. Okay, and Logos is the subject of one A, one B, and one C. The first phrase says in Arche and Halogos. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, which actually should be translated as. At the time of the beginning, the word already was. Okay. The second phrase, kai uh, halogos in prostontheon, means, and the word was with the God. It's not, we, in English, we say the God. The Greeks follows the Jewish mindset of, we just don't have God, we have the God. Okay. And that's referring to God the Father. Okay. So, and the word is in intimate fellowship with the God, with God. Okay, so he's at the beginning, and we later on find out in verse 3 that he causes the beginning to happen. He is in intimate fellowship with God, and then the third phrase says, and everything that God was, the word was also. And it takes the word thee off of the front of God to say that um, it creates what we, what's known as a subset proposition, where we have uh, God here as the Godhead. And it's saying the father belongs in here, but also the word belongs in there. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but, you know, you, you threw these things out, author, agent, and advocate mm -hmm. uh, in the process. And, and so 
uh, the advocate belongs there too, but isn't referenced at this point. Uh, the advocate being the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Well, well, but see, Jesus calls himself the advocate first. And then he says, I will send another advocate like me. Right. right. Okay. Uh, yeah. He's but also part of the Godhead, right? Or right, God. right. But see, the, the if we start introducing the Trinity here, we're not listening to the text. Okay. Okay. The, the text wants to first associate, and I'll put W and S here, as the relationship between the Father and the Son. Okay. And then... Uh, at the end of John's gospel, he develops this uh, theology of the Holy Spirit. He shares that with us because the Holy Spirit, if this is God's people, the P, the Holy Spirit then is sent, uh, is, is the Father and the Son's way, the Father and the Son's way of making their dwelling with the ones who love the Father. And this is John chapter 14, verse 23. Uh, if anyone loves the father and you know loves me and loves my father, uh, I and the father will come and will make our dwelling place that person. Okay, so uh, the the Holy Spirit becomes then it, it's certainly uh, a part of it. But John's purpose is not really mm -hmm. to describe the function of the Trinity as the flow of salvation, and then who becomes the agent who seals us. Right. So last question, I promise it out. And then you, you, you alluded to, to the fact that you, Jesus' ministry might be from three to five years. And I realized that in the, at least from my readings, I've not seen anything definitively that says it was just three or three and a half years, but I guess I've always kind of been bathed in that notion. I've not heard the five years until tonight. And I'm yeah. just wondering, how do you do that? Or okay, um, Herod's Temple. Okay. In John chapter two, Jesus says, destroy this temple in three uh, days, I'll raise it up. Mm -hmm. And they say, it's been 46 years that we've been working on this thing and we're still not finished with it. Uh -huh. Okay. Now we know that Herod's temple, that they began work on it in 19 uh, or 20 BCE. Okay, so if we if we take this as 20 and we go 46 years into the future, then this is somewhere, depending on what time of year this is, somewhere around 26 or 27 BC, okay? And if, uh, excuse me, uh, and if Jesus dies in 33, which is the date uh, that I hold to, then this is somewhere near, and like I say, it's probably a partial year, somewhere near year, five plus years if you go from 27 to 33 and it's late in the year. So um, uh, if, if Jesus dies in 30, uh, then, you know, then it's more like a three-year ministry, but uh, I hold that uh, Jesus' um, death has to be around 33 B.C., because otherwise the conversation to Pilate doesn't make any sense. You know, what, why does Pilate just all of a sudden say, okay, I'll crucify him, uh, when he clearly doesn't want to. Pilate's wife says, baby, leave this man alone, he's righteous. And then Pilate talks to Jesus and says, I can't see anything that you've done wrong. I mean, you haven't even offended me. So what the, the Jews then tell him is that, uh, okay, Pilate, if you don't crucify him, you're not a um, Caesarea Michi, okay, a Michi Caesarea, a friend of Caesar, and that's a technical term. So why is this important? Well, it's it's important because in the year um, uh, 31 AD or CE, the Common Era, there is one of Pilate's good friends is a fellow by the name of uh, Lucius Alias Sejanus, my pen is out again here, S-E-J-A-N-U-S, Sejanus. So Sejanus uh, and Pilate are good friends, and they both hate Jews, all right? They hate Jews with a passion. 
in the year 31 uh, AD, Sejanus tries, he storms the capital, <laughs> all right? And he tries uh, to overthrow the, the emperor. Well, we don't have any emperors named Sejanus. What does that tell you? He was caught and he was executed. Okay, if your best friend storms the Capitol and then the FBI and the CIA comes, CIA comes to your house and go, do you know Jim Johnson? You go, no, oh, man, he you know, went to high school with me, man, but I never hung around that dude because he was crazy. You know, you distance yourself. So Pilate is ready because to irritate the Jews by letting Jesus go. But when they say that if you do this, you're no friend of Caesar, they're saying to him, you're going to allow this man to say he's king of the Jews when we have no king but Caesar. And this, the ludicrousness of that is because the Jews that you would typically say, we have no God but Yahweh. Okay, but now to get Jesus killed, they're ready to, they, they, you know, they're dumping their party platform and say, we don't have any king but Caesar. What about you? So doesn't this sound like you're allowing an insurrection and you're supporting it? And that's when Pilate says, okay, but you, I'm washing my hands of this. And Jesus tell Pilate, don't worry, you, you don't have the greater sin than this. Okay, you see the picture? So if this is 30 AD, then they can't threaten uh, Pilate with anything. And he's, he's already been ruthless and Rome has had to reprimand him. But if this is after 31, Pilate takes that comment, you know, friend of Caesar, he takes that serious, like, if this gets back, then it sounds like I'm supporting an insurrection of some sort. And maybe Sejanus and I had some other, you know, plans for the empire. And Pilate goes, nah. <laughs> so, so he allows the crucifixion. So, so this, um, if this is going on in uh, like late 27 or something along it, possibly even 28, okay? Um, uh, depending on when we look at the start of the temple, if it's talking about the Naas, that would have been a, that's the inner sanctum, that would have been even a little after. So 46 years from that point puts us around 27. I mean, the outer court's 26, 27, but uh, the, the, the inner sanctum around 28, and that's about five years. So Jesus' ministry would have already been underway. Um, uh, his public ministry, wedding at Cana and and afterwards but john isn't totally chronological but but i believe he's actually absolutely absolutely right right here so his his full public ministry is probably more like five years matthew mark and luke seem to collapse it a bit because they're they, all the gospels start with john the baptist and end with the um with the uh uh passion week but they don't all give us the the same chronology Okay, and some things that Jesus does at the end of the other Gospels, he does at the beginning of the Gospel of John. But remember, John's out to prove a point not to be. He's generally chronological, but not always absolute. But when they bring up 46 years uh, to this point, we can date that because we know when Herod's temple was started. That's a long answer, but I hope that uh, uh, you. Mm -hmm. And I studied under a... Um, a, a Cambridge graduate who was one of the world's at the time uh, he was living foremost um, uh, experts on the Her Herodian dynasty and also the um, the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. a excellent chronologist. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doc, we're gonna close it out. Okay. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> but, uh, but but good discussion. Thank you so much tonight. And I want to invite everybody to please join in on next week for the finale, final class. Um, and it's going to be great. You don't want to miss next Monday night um, as we come to the close of the Book of, Book of Glory. And also, um, we're looking for your comments and your uh, put in the chat any, any suggestion for us uh, that we want to include going forth. So, again, thank you for donation you made. And if you can, Give whatever you can to try to donate to, if you want to see this ministry go for. So, Doc, you close tonight. Professor, I yeah. got to come back. I always say, Doc, but just good, good, Doc, Doc's just fine. Doc's just fine. <laughs> Professor yeah. Green, please uh, close tonight with a word of prayer, um, praying for our nation. Do that for us, please. Oh, excellent. Uh, just we want to be reminded, as Jesus taught here, eternal life is a relationship with the Father through the Son. It's not just living a long time. 
it lasts forever because of the nature of the parties involved. If we're in Christ and he lives forever and we're in him and the God, the God, the father is forever. It lasts forever because the relationship is already wired that way. And we've been ported in through it, through Jesus, death and resurrection. Okay. Uh, Heavenly father, we pray and just ask that, uh, your people who are called by your name and specifically your son's name uh, would live out the um, ramifications of our, our calling and our creed in Christ Jesus. Uh, Lord, help us to be uh, loving in a superior way uh, in a world that is uh, and a country right now that certainly has its representatives and its apostles of hate uh, dealing in death and in evil and in hatred. And uh, Lord, we pray um, that uh, those of us who know the gospel are prepared to live it and demonstrate uh, the powerful love of Jesus Christ, uh, the uh, sanctifying and atoning grace uh, and, and, and life that comes through him. Lord, we pray for all of those who um, uh, have uh, lost uh, loved ones, as all of us uh, are united, both uh, because we're humans and because we're Americans. Uh, we, we share in their loss, if, if, even though our hearts do not have the same degree of grief uh, as those who are, are missing their loved ones today. Uh, Lord, we, we pray also uh, for those whose hearts are filled with evil, even if they're quoting Bible verses and they're filled with evil. This is part of Satan's deceit, that he masquerades as an angel of light when in truth he's about total darkness. Uh, we pray for all of those who are uh, whose hearts are filled with hate, hatred, racial and otherwise. And we pray that um, through your word and through the living and preaching of the gospel, that they would come uh, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, we know, Lord, that the world, world does get worse uh, before you come, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a, a period where for a while we have revival. And, Lord, we pray for revival um, so that uh, uh, we will uh, truly live to be your people, not just citizens of the United States, but citizens of heaven who just happen to live here for the present. This is temporary, but uh, our union and our commonwealth, uh, uh, being a part of your commonwealth is permanent. Uh, give us grace through this season. Uh, give us uh, the wisdom not to uh, return evil or ev for evil or return hate for hate, but always your love. But at the same time, Lord, yes, let us call for justice um, because you give us the responsibility and you give governments the responsibility of uh, dealing with evildoers. Uh, all of these things we pray, Lord, would be um, just a wonderful concert if uh, we would all attend to your will. Uh, give us not just a fear of God, which is a conscious against um, a relative value, rather, of good and evil but give us a true fear of you that leads to the saving knowledge of your son. Transform us even in this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night. We'll see you all next time. God all bless right. you. God bless you. <laughs> I hope you come to the Elders Council, Reverend Dr. Billy, Reverend Dr. Chavez. It's my plan to be there. <laughs> all right. Yes, see sir. All right. all right, I'll be there. All right.